Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the final webinar in our thematic series. Today, we're going to be focusing on playing the game, so video games and esports, given the release of our ETF game earlier this year. So we're really excited to be able to speak about this one today. I think there's lots of interesting developments within the space and, and plenty to talk about. Just before we begin, before we get started, just wanted to, uh, to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, all information in this presentation is general in nature and doesn't constitute personal, personal financial advice. We're going to try and keep this uh, to a quick 20 minute presentation with time for questions at the end. So please feel free to ask any question using the questions box on your screen at any point during the presentation. And if you cannot stay for the entire presentation, don't worry, we'll be sure to send you a copy of the slides along with a recording of the session um, and questions later this afternoon. Joining me today is Ben Smith, who's an account manager within our business and also has a strong passion for gaming and a strong knowledge of the industry and investment thesis in general. Welcome today, Ben. Thanks, Blair. Great to be here. So just getting started in terms of the evolution of gaming, uh, tell me a bit about how gaming's evolved since its beginnings. Um, you know, it's Pong in the arcades and the early console market. I know, I know the market's definitely moved on from some of my favourite titles like GoldenEye and Age of Empires, but there's still huge demand for these classic games, as well as the technology developments which make the all-round experience even more thrilling. So just if you wanted to start by touching on some of the evolutions within the space. Yeah, sure. So you're right. Since sort of the, the initial beginnings in the 70s, um, we were looking at things like Pong and the very early arcade gaming. That industry uh, has grown rapidly. So it's grown to a state today where in 2021, around $176 billion was generated in revenue from the industry in total. And that's actually more than the global film business in addition to North American sporting. So it really has become a, a, a very large universe and a large revenue stream for a lot of companies that investors might not be um, sort of aware of. Now, what's interesting is that as we've seen sort of the evolution of different platforms and different consoles, whether that's your traditional consoles like the PlayStation and Xbox, PC gaming, um, handheld gaming even sort of had its heyday in the early 2000s. What's interesting to see is that throughout that evolution, the total revenue has increased significantly. So if we cast our minds back to sort of that classic arcade era in the 80s when Games like Pac-Man and Space Invaders were all the rage. At this point in time, we're looking at revenue from purely the mobile gaming market of almost twice the size of the arcade gaming market back at that time at its peak. So there has been this rapid growth and evolution. Um, at the moment, the mobile gaming market, so if we think about games like Candy Crush, Angry Birds are two sort of classic titles these sort of games are, are making up the primary, pri or primarily making up the revenue split for the gaming industry today. And companies that develop those games are generating revenue from in-game content there. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we probably all realise that the gaming industry is big business, but just some of the numbers there, like the North American uh, sports market and movie market put together is just, you know, that, that's an incredible amount of business when, when you put it into that um, sort of comparison. Ben, we know that gaming transcends traditional borders. What we're probably not aware of is the growing market of esports and how that's become a worldwide phenomenon. Are you able to just run through the market for this in a little bit more detail as well? Sure. So geographically speaking, when we think about gaming and esports, most of the demand is actually coming from the Asia Pacific, and a lot of that's being driven by China. Now, China has been one of sort of the early adopters of professional esports. So, esports, for those who aren't really aware, it is sort of a quite a new industry. It is an opportunity for people to play online games in a professional sporting capacity. So, instead of your NRL or AFL, you can tune in and watch. Uh, teams play against each other in games like League of Legends or World of Warcraft. Now, what was really interesting about this new arena of sporting is that during COVID-19, particularly sort of in 2020, 
a lot of sporting, traditional sporting events were postponed or cancelled. So if we think about the Olympics in Tokyo that were postponed to 2021, the NRL season in Australia um, was also pushed back. And what, what was interesting is that we saw a lot of consumers, instead of turning to football or rugby, they'd actually tune in to online esports. And so particularly in China, 36% of the population watched professional esports, really a huge market there. And what was very interesting is that even after the lockdowns of 2020, we saw that this percentage either stayed the same or increased in a lot of countries in 2021. So despite the fact that real sport was coming back online, so to speak, people were still interested in tuning in to these esport events. So if we think about sort of the US and the UK, there was an increase of 10% of the population watching esports during COVID-19. That increased to a range of between 14 and 16%. So while this is sort of a very uh, a fresh market, there is definitely demand for these esports and these esports events. And so the game ETF seeks to capture that segment as well as your more traditional game developers or console developers. It's pretty interesting and I think another thing in the space that's that's caught me by surprise the sheer number of people post covid filling out stadiums to um to, to watch these these games as they um uh, they they sort of happen in in live uh viewing. Uh so certainly growing in um in not only revenues but also just sheer number of people attending and um and, and participating. Ben, just moving on, um, talking about gaming and, and that next level, gaming certainly changed over the last 20 years and with it, the supply chain and the way we access different titles has also shifted dramatically. You know, 20 years ago, I had to physically go to a retail shop like EB Games, purchase a copy of the game in packaging and then take it home and install it. With increased data speeds and the ability to host gaming online, we're now able to access titles from within our own home without going anywhere. Ben, can you talk us through some of the improved financial aspects from for, for businesses in doing this rather than printing packaging and so on and so forth? Definitely. So this is something that, that many investors might not necessarily be aware of, but it's an example where an advancement in technology has allowed businesses to basically improve their income statements through their margins. So as you mentioned, Blair, um, if I think back to when I was heavily into gaming, uh, I would go to EB Games, I'd then buy you know, a Pokemon cartridge for my Nintendo DS or something, um, and then sort of buy that from a secondhand retailer. Um, that's the physical distribution model of the older world, and it only makes up around 17% market share today. The primary source of distribution for video game developers is digital. So instead of paying money, printing discs, packaging those discs, and then passing them on to a middleman such as EB Games or GameStop in the US. These developers are basically able to distribute the game file online through an online store, so such as the PlayStation Store or, uh, or Steam, for example. Now, the benefit of that is they're not paying for packaging, they're not paying for printing of discs, they're not paying as much for advertising. And for these reasons, uh, the the gross margins of the business, so the sales less the cost of sales, are much higher. So for the old school physical distribution model, the gross margins range between 40 to 50%. With the new digital distribution model that most game developers now subscribe to, that margin increases to 70 to 85%. So these businesses throughout time, not only has demand for their products increased significantly, but their income statements and their financials and their opportunity to turn a profit has also improved. It's it's really interesting again just to see the the, the change in in the space of only you know 15, 20 years to, to where we are today. So Ben, the big trend on everyone's mind at the moment is the metaverse. Um, does this ETF sort of link with this theme at all? Does it does it play into it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So the metaverse is sort of a topic on a lot of people's minds when it comes to tech. Um, we saw Meta spend $10 billion on their, their sort of metaverse development last financial year. So it's something that a lot of people are turning their eyes to. And 
it's actually quite closely linked to online gaming and the idea of creating social experiences for consumers um, within a virtual environment. So sort of anecdotally, uh, Activision Blizzard, who develops the game Call of Duty, that's a first person shooter, um, they found that people who played with their friends in groups were likely to spend three times as much time and three times as much money on in-game content versus a player who was just playing solo by himself or herself. So we're seeing how creating a social experience where you can spend time with friends in an online forum uh, actually leads to increased use of the game and increased revenue for some of these companies. So a lot of those video game companies are, are quite focused on this metaverse component and one of the companies that is in the game ETF that has really managed to tap into that is Roblox. So Roblox is a game uh, sort of targeted at children, but in the US, over half of the population under the age of 16 play this game. So they've really managed to sort of tap into something quite incredible here. But the idea of Roblox is you sign in, you sign in with your friends, you're then able to play user-generated content. And because this user-generated content can be monetized, they've actually managed to create a marketplace within the game. So there is a, an economy almost between the gamers and the people who develop games or, or program games, which they can then basically sell to gamers. So through this whole economy and through this idea of creating a, a virtual reality where you can spend time with friends that you might not necessarily be able to spend time with during a COVID lockdown, for example, um, that has seen huge uptake, particularly in, in the US. Yeah, that's, um, that's certainly food for thought, especially um, with, with the metaverse really gaining traction in social dialogue, both here and, and the rest of the world. Um, I, I guess to, to move into some more nuts and bolts of the, the ETF itself um, and some of the underlying companies that, that are a part of the ETF, can you talk us through what's so attractive about some of them when it comes to sales and profits and then maybe a little bit to the underlying fundamental uh, business model of, of the different components within within the ETF as well, Ben? Certainly. So the, the game ETF, we're looking to hold around 50 companies in the industry here. Now, what's really attractive about uh, segments such as developers, we sort of discussed it a bit earlier, but their gross margins can be very attractive because they're not spending a lot on distribution. They create the game, which is then distributed very widely uh, online. So looking at margins are between sort of 75 to 80% for a lot of these companies here. The ETF aims to hold three different kinds of companies. The first is your traditional developer or publisher, uh, which is my, what you might think of when you think of a, a video game company. So a company like Electronic Arts, which does a lot of first person shooters as well as sporting games. Um, companies like Sega, for example, which developed Sonic um, are some of the games that will hold in that segment of the ETF. The second segment is not as large a part as the developers, but is rapidly growing. It's companies that operate in the esports space. So whether that's owning esports teams or they're organizing tournaments such as C Limited, um, these are companies that operate in that space and are going to see increased revenue from increasing demand in e-sporting events. And then finally, we're holding hardware companies that build the nuts and bolts behind consoles, for example. So Nintendo, who is also a developer, create uh, the Nintendo Wii U, which is a, a handheld console. So these are some of the companies that we look to invest in through this ETF and it is quite quite a broad range as well. Fantastic. That is all we have in terms of formalities for the, the discussion today on, on esports and gaming. Um, of course, there are things to keep in mind and, and certainly when we make these slides available, I would encourage you to look through the risks involved in the investment and, um, and come to a conclusion on the appropriateness for yourself. But now we're going to move into some more Q&A type of um, discussion. And Ben, I think I can see some, some coming through there, some for me, some for you. 
um, and, and we'll sort of sort of get to them all as they come through. Um, ben, maybe maybe you you've got some for me. I've just seen them come. Yeah. Through. Yeah. So Blair, um, there's an interesting one here just about uh, takeovers in the space. So um, we saw Activision Blizzard. They were they were acquired last year. Um, could you talk a bit about yeah, sort of some of the maybe if there's any other sort of M&A activity in the space and, and what that might mean for the broader industry? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, game hit the market mid-February amid a flurry of significant deal activity in the sector. Um, so the fund itself includes 50 of those biggest names, you know, Tencent, Nintendo, Electronic Arts, these types of businesses. And with that then comes a lot of M&A activity. So in January, I think we saw three significant deals which were inked between some of the larger larger tech companies and well-known game developers. So Sony, Microsoft, Take-Two, all making significant acquisitions. Um, so you're right, there was that $69 or $69 billion purchase of Activision Blizzard by, um, by Microsoft. So that company, which, which would have been a big holding in the portfolio, you know, Warcraft, Diablo, Call of Duty, these sorts of games that everyone's familiar with. Um, Sony Inter Interactive Entertainment spent $3.6 billion on Bungie, so uh, a company behind the games of Destiny and, and Halo franchises. And then take two, uh, $12.7 billion takeover of a mobile game developer called Zynga. Um, so people might be familiar with the title there, that the Farmville series. So. No, they're, they're, they're looking to capture a greater share of the global games market. We're seeing a lot of consolidation. Um, we spoke about the size of the market before in, in you know, taking on North American sporting and, and cinema industries. Um, so certainly, you know, very interesting going forward from a, a revenue and profitability, profitability point of view and therefore um, from an investment sense, we think as well. That's great. So Thanks, ben, Blair. Just seeing some more come through here, talking about how game might be able to diversify some of the holdings on, on if you're holding direct shares on the ASX or even Australian listed um, you know, ETFs, how, how can game sort of diversify you away from that? Yeah, so what's pretty unique about this ETF, if you're holding something like the A200, which is just an Australian equities ETF, our market, our Australian domestic market is extremely underexposed to gaming companies. So there's none in the ASX 200 at all, no gaming or esports companies. So we think about this massive market that's, you know, bigger than the global film business, uh, in addition to North American sporting in terms of revenue. And you're not getting access to that through your traditional Australian based holdings. So it's really an area that's very underexposed for Australian equities, which make it a really great thematic for investors who are looking to diversify away um, from, from you know, your sort of more standard companies that the ASX is overweight in, such as the banks or the miners. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think that's that's a really good point. It is a way to to gain access to things that we don't traditionally have in, in our you know home domiciled market. Um, there's there's a final one there. I think the last question, just on market volatility and in terms of the tech sector just being you know, volatile over the first six months of this year. I think I think that's a good point. Um, and and what, are, what where do we see the, the future of technology and in particular gaming? I mean, what what I'd say to that is we're probably more bullish on or we are more bullish on thematic products where um, than, than what we are you know short term volatility of the market. Um, and, and we certainly argue that there, there are certain mega trends within the space, you know, climate change, demographics and, and technology that, you know, will certainly um, have you know, peaks and troughs in terms of price movement, but identify long term structural change within the economy and identifying them early um, and holding them for a long period of time could could potentially give you some outperformance in terms of capturing an idea. So whether that mega trend is indeed gaming, whether it's payments or things like this, rather than looking at the short term volatility of the market and going, oh, well, th th this, this looks like it's a, a falling knife, potentially looking at it and going, this may be, if we believe that this is a long term opportunity, maybe a good you know, time to enter a position um, within that particular thematic is, is how I'd look at that. Ben, would you, would you have anything to add there? 
Yeah, I think I think that's a great point, and it sort of links up with Paul's question here, um, just around the future trend of NFTs and and gamify. Um, we've chosen this thematic because we believe it has a lot of potential in the future. Whether that sort of includes NFTs or cryptocurrency, um, if we think about you know your your sort of NFT based or crypto based online metaverses like the Sandbox. These are all companies that potentially could be included in the ETF in the future. Um, so we have sort of made sure to pick these thematics in a way that we think where they're going to have long-term viability in the future. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Ben. Um, there's, there's just a couple of questions coming through here. I'm, I'm, I think we'll, we'll be happy to tackle, just having a look at them. Um, do you, this is an interesting one, Ben. So a few months ago, and this is from, from Paul as well, I'm um, just talking about the crackdown in, in China on gaming, preventing kids playing too many games. Just a personal opinion, do you think that can cause any issue on a lost generation of Chinese gamers and then um, potentially affecting, you know, revenues of these businesses going forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting question. Um, Look, I don't claim to be an expert in sort of the, the Chinese regulatory authority, um, but what's interesting this year is we've sort of seen how China in particular hasn't performed too well if we think about some of those big tech names like Tencent, which is also involved in video games. But I think it's woken a lot of investors up to the fact that China is a developing market and there is significant regulatory, regulatory risk for investments in that area. Now, as we sort of saw a bit earlier, around half of the revenue is generated from, from the Asia Pacific in the video gaming segment. Um, and most of that is coming from, from China. But again, look, with all ETFs, they do have their risks, particularly with ETFs with a large exposure to China or Asia, there are going to be regulatory risks. And we always, we always ask investors to, to look into those risks before investing. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how that demand is going to be shaped by the Chinese regulatory authorities. But there's obviously a lot of demand in the US as well when we think about games like Roblox, for example. Um, so I, unfortunately, I can't give you a, a very specific answer there, Paul, but hopefully that gives you a bit of bit of context. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point, Ben. Um, you know, regulations, nothing new within the Chinese market. We, saw, we, we see that wax and wane a little bit. Um, throughout you know diff different years and different cycles, um, but but you know I think in the main China China's technology industry is a big part of their economy, um, and and so the potential for them to want to impact that too greatly is is interesting going forward, but probably not something that over the long term is is going to have a huge impact on, on you know gaming. One more, Ben, just, just off the top of your head, and you, you may not know, but a, a question from Peter. Um, is there any betting companies or are there any betting companies or sports or horse racing within the, the gaming ETF? Yeah, so there are a couple um, within the ETF that focus on sort of casino games. Um, and these are usually mobile apps that are, that are developed by large companies that can pump out a significant amount of mobile apps. So there are a couple of companies within the ETF there. There's some of the smaller holdings. So the bigger holdings um, sort of tend to be the big developers. So uh, Roblox, EA, Nintendo, but there are also some smaller companies that specialize in mobile apps, particularly around casino games. And you can see all of those holdings just on our website um, under the fund webs web page there, Peter. And that's updated on a, on a daily basis in terms of what's what's held in the fund and at what weighting. Uh, look, thank you everyone for your questions today. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And we're, we're 24 minutes in, so just a little bit over time. Um, so happy happy to leave it there. But if there are any questions that come through, please interact with us on our, our social media channels um, or, or through email. More than happy to, to touch on them at a later date. Um, and of course, we will be making this presentation available prior to a post conclusion um, and later this afternoon. So once again, love to thank everyone for attending today. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Ben, thank you very much for your insights and, um, and, and thank you very much for your time. And um, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.